So part of why I love the move toward electrification and the future of transportation is that we finally have a chance to have new companies with new visions emerge, which was just not something we would have in the old gasoline engine uh, era. And today I am joined by probably one of the most exciting companies in this space, Lucid Motors and their CEO, Peter Rawlinson. Peter, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Ricky. Good to meet you. I'm Peter Rawlinson, CEO of Lucid Motors, all-electric car company. Yeah, and you just had your special event, 9-9, September 9th. The world probably knows about you now and has seen your, your flagship car, the Air. I got to tell you, that is part of why I'm so excited to be talking to you because I was blown away by that event. I've known about the car for a while, but actually seeing it at this level and knowing that we're, you know, we're coming up on production is, is just really exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting for us. And it's great that uh, to have the opportunity to share with more of the world uh, what we're doing and, 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 and really for, for people like yourself to realize that this is real. Yeah, absolutely. One of the questions, actually, as I was thinking about this that I had for you is, we've seen the air at the event. How close is it to final, final production? Well, I, I think in terms of is visually, it's 99% there. Um, what you saw was a beta prototype, which has been hand built with uh, some prototype parts to represent full production intent. Clearly, if that was a, a full production vehicle, we wouldn't have to wait six months to be making them next spring. We'd be, we'd be making them and putting them in, in, in buyer's hands tomorrow. Uh, so I would say that um, aesthetically, it's 99% representative. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, more development to go on the engineering side. Uh, and certainly quite a bit on the software side, I'd say. Gotcha. One other thing about the, the taillight design, I was thinking, because, you know, the car has mirrors and it looks like it's ready to go. This wasn't some crazy vision that people show off. This was a car that clearly is pretty much there. The one question I had for you was about the taillight design. Here in the U.S., is there, isn't there a requirement that the taillight has to be kind of affixed to the car and not a part of a moving trunk lid or boot uh, the, the regulation is that the lights are v visible at all times when the when the trunk is up so we've got a second set of lights inside which shine rearwards so we meet that regulation brilliant ah okay i knew you'd have a good answer for that that's great and um another question i had for you is around safety one of the things i've mentioned in previous videos is that Electric vehicles are inherently safer. You don't have a huge mass in the front. You have a bigger crumple zone. The CG, the center of gravity of the vehicle, is way lower. And the, the rollover rate is just drastically reduced. And the rollover is probably one of the most critical and dangerous aspects of a crash. I was just wondering what kinds of consideration from a design perspective you've placed on, on safety with the, with the air. Well, well, and safety is the number one priority that transcends all other design engineering considerations. And you're absolutely right. Having a low center of gravity really makes a rollover less likely. But of course, a part of the, the test procedures uh, for FMVSS is, is roof crush. Uh, we, we've, we've recently tested a car of one of our uh, beta prototypes for that. It's looking pretty good. Um, the other thing is, you quite rightly say, that without a traditional internal combustion engine, uh, we have more free crumple space in, a, in an electric car. And we've taken that a next step with Lucid Air because we've got uh, power units, which uh, we presented at our event on 9.9, which are truly miniaturized. They're super small. And the smaller you can make that uh, power unit, the less incompressible length there is in, a, in your crumple zone. So you have a longer, softer crumple, which is a great safety enhancing feature as well. So all round electric cars offer uh, engineering design opportunities to enhance the safety of the car and save lines. And when you mentioned the drive unit, we're talking kind of the, the gear reduction set, the motor inverter, is that all? like one assembly? Correct, so there's strictly speaking four elements in that integrated drive unit. 
motor, inverter, drive unit, and of course the differential. One of the articles I was recently reading before our call was about um, one of the air prototypes doing some laps around a racetrack. And it kind of got me thinking about your kind of racing pedigree and what I knew Lucid Air mostly for before the 99 event was the fact that you guys were supplying batteries for Formula E, right? Yeah, we, that's right. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and we did that really to, to demonstrate that we are the real deal in terms of world-class technology. And so um, we power all 24 cars on the grid of that world championship, electric world championship. And our battery pack really enabled that the breakthrough, first time the cars were able, the generation two cars, able to complete a full race distance on a single charge with over 58 kilowatt hour pack. And all those packs were designed, developed, engineered, tested, analyzed, and are manufactured in this very building, our, our head office here in Silicon Valley. So where does the, the passion for racing come from? Are you a big racing fan growing up or historically? Well, I am a big racing fan, but I actually take a more annoyance view and my hard-nosed view uh, for, for the role of racing uh, for, for, for Lucid. Uh, we haven't got a racing team. Uh, we don't pay to put stickers on a car, as many do, and sort of quote some sort of pseudo-technology with a real deal, with a real supplier, a real world-class battery technology to all the teams and we get paid for that so unusually we actually make a profit out of our racing endeavors usually a company uh, spends money racing as part of its marketing uh, it's it's the actual uh, the inverse here at lucid we're actually paid because people want to buy our world-class technology for others to go racing with and and, and long may it remain that way that is really remarkable. And I think that's part of the the interest that I have for you guys. I'm also an engineer. So I, as I see some of the, the announcements, yeah. When I see some of the announcements in this space, I always think, what's your IP? A lot of companies are trying to cash in, I think, on the, the excitement around electrification. But if you break down, like, what is it that you provide? That's kind of lacking at times. With Lucid, I was blown away by this fact. It's not really here's a theoretical thing we could do, here's a render, here's a mock-up. We've, we've been providing this for, for some time now. That really, I think, lends to the, the IP that you guys have established. And I think that's, for me, one of the things that really makes the air stand out as, as, as being much further along than people might realize, I think. In, indeed. And I mean, the company is actually 13 years old. And what have we done in all that time? Well, for a large part of that time, we were actually a battery technology company uh, making and selling battery packs to real world applications. Our packs have accrued over 20 million miles, trouble free. We've not had a, a, a bad incident yet. And uh, in all that time, in 20 million miles, uh, with the suppliers to uh, the World Championship Electric Race Series, um, and, and then from building upon that battery technology, we started developing our own powertrain ready for our own car a few years ago. And, and it's a really interesting story because uh, the whole concept of the car, the Lucid Air, was predicated upon uh, the premise, the assumption that we'd be able to miniaturize that powertrain and make a revolutionary type of car, which no one had ever done before, which really really capitalized upon that that miniaturization of the powertrain to make a car which is uh, smaller and more compact on the outside more nimble more sporty more usable in a big city yet more fun to drive and much more spacious on the inside uh, more luxurious more comfortable more legroom no one had ever done that before it never been possible before with an internal combustion engine layout but even for us uh, we kind of had to sort of bet the entire house on it because we bet the design of that car upon our own ability to miniaturize that powertrain. And we had to do those two things in parallel at the same time because if we spent years developing a super small powertrain and then developed the car, it would never happen. So we actually did the two things in parallel 
on the basis that we would be able to achieve. And we, we plan for success. And that's what's made uh, Lucid Air such a landmark product. And it comes back, Ricky, to the point you made earlier. I, I mean, I don't think I would have been able to achieve this if I was still working for a legacy automaker, because, you know, that would have been very big risk for me to sell the company. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a startup company, we recognized that we had to innovate, that the greatest risk of all would be not to innovate. So innovation is very uh, central to our very being. And therefore, uh, we welcome that, that challenge, that technical challenge. And it's actually come to fruition now in an amazing way. Yeah, before I switch gears and talk about the, the car layout, because I have a lot of questions about that as well. Um, to your point about being kind of a leader in battery technology, which a lot of viewers probably don't realize, I wanted to ask you about the um, the residential and grid scale battery solutions you guys offered. I think in the entire announcement, the biggest surprise was that. I, I did not see that coming. Um, I believe you guys call it ESS. What does that stand for, by the way? ESS Energy Storage System. I hate these sort of an acronyms and uh... Uh, it's, it's, I, I'd rather call it a battery pack in many ways, a, sta a stationary battery pack, because that's what it is. But it's an ESS, and it's kind of an industry standard term for energy storage system. And, and what's really interesting is um, we've got a modular approach to our battery pack in the car, and that gives us packaging flexibility. And we've got modules which are super um, economic to, to manufacture, and we can truly mass produce these. And what's really exciting is because they are so mass producible and so economical to make in the first place, that same technology lends itself to the ESS. Now, that is unlike some other car, electric car companies that are uh, in this space where their battery technology is more expensive to make, so they can't transition it to the ESS. But then we get a multiplier effect because we get an economy of scale in using it for the ESS, then it comes back into the car. And what's often misunderstood with this is that ESS inherently does require different cell chemistry because with ESS, it's not, weight isn't so critical as a car. What well, with for a car, you really want a gravimetrically energy dense cell chemistry. That, well, by that I mean how many kilowatt hours per kilogram or watt hours per kilogram. That doesn't matter so much with a st static storage system. The weight inherently is less of a, a design constraint or an issue. Uh, what's more important there is the cost effectiveness of the, uh, the energy capacity. So there you look for cell chemistry, which gives you a good uh, watt hours per dollar. And it's a straight swap. Um, between those two chemistries, but the inherent technology is the same. And that's what's so exciting about this because it'll help drive down the cost in the car. Got it. So the chemistries might vary between the two applications. What about the form factor? Form factor is the same. So we're gonna use cylindrical 21700s throughout. And who are you partnering with for manufacturing batteries? So um, yeah, it's an interesting point you make because um, let's differentiate between cell manufacture and battery pack. Uh, Lucid is primarily expert in battery pack and battery pack integration, although we do have a, a rudimentary knowledge of cell chemistry. And we're working with LG Chem as our suppliers for the cells for uh, Lucid Air. And we have a multi-year supply contract sewn up with LG Chem, and they're a great partner. We co-developed cell chemistry for um, uh, Lucid Air, which is truly state of the art, and is part of the reason we're able to get 517 miles estimated EPA range for um, the uh, Grand Touring version of Lucid Air. We've also co-developed some interesting internal developments in that 21700 cell, uh, which actually is compatible with the way we integrate it into the Lucid pack and our design philosophy, and specifically to reduce the impedance of the pack so we can reduce the I squared R losses, the heating losses that a pack incurs when the car accelerates. One of the things I, 
I saw in your presentation, I thought was brilliant, is you've really optimized the internal storage and and passenger cabin for the car. Uh, on the outside, what what class of car would you most liken it to? Is it like a Mercedes S class? Is it an E class? Like in terms of like the exterior dimensions? Oh gosh, well, I mean, the exterior dimensions are closer to an E class than an S class. I mean, actually, um, our car is um, it's smaller than a Tesla Model S. It's shorter. It's narrower. It's actually smaller than a Porsche Taycan. Unbelievably, people see the pictures of our spacious interior and think, my goodness, that's a huge lumbering limousine. It's like a made car. It's actually shorter than a Taycan, Porsche Taycan. It's narrower than a Taycan. It's, 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 it's smaller and more nimble than a Taycan. But it's got this incredible interior space. And that's what's so revolutionary about the damn thing. And this is something that I don't think anyone really saw coming, that we had this vision of how we could redesign a car from the ground up around the miniaturization of these electric components in a way nobody's done before. It's really surprising. Um, there's been some stabs at it, um, but no one's taken it even close to the level that we have now. And that extends to the, the front as well. Yeah, in your presentation, when you had the, the breakout and you showed the seating compartments and you showed everything stretch out, the final thing in that video was that the exterior dimensions shrunk in. So I knew there was going to be some, that's surprising. I would have, I would have thought it was closer to the S class would, would have been my prediction, but that is really incredible packaging. Thank you. And of course, what we, we, we're not able to offer yet at, at launch with Dream Edition we, we, are the, the executive rear seats, the aircraft inspired rear seats, and they are coming, uh, but they will be, be available about a year after we launch. So probably early 22 will bring in that edition of the car with those aircraft rear seats, which are really exciting. And they've got um, 55 degrees recline capability. And, you know, that really turns the car into another sort of car. It's almost like a mini Maybach uh, exactly. in that specification. All right, cool. So I have a year or two to grow this channel big enough to, to have a full-time driver. That's, that's good uh, yeah, indeed, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> can help the interest in your channel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, so Peter, one question I had for you. Um, I, I think COVID-19 is a more long-term like change in our world than people think. I think a lot of people think, oh, when we'll have a vaccine and the world will be right back to where it was. And I, I think being in tech, I think the, the world is going to be shifting. So I was kind of curious, how has the, the pandemic affected lucid and maybe the rollout strategy how has it maybe caused delays with other things how has it been overall yeah well it is a very different world isn't it and, and i tend to agree with you uh, i think the genie is out of the bottle and i think that the the, the virus is with us for uh, uh you know uh, years to come even even if a, a successful vaccine is is ultimately found um, so uh, I, it's interesting, uh, this spring I was actually in New York and we were um, getting ready for what was going to be our launch at New York Auto Show. And, you know, I got out of New York with, and there was an ominous feeling uh, to, the, to the city. And I got out just before the virus really got a grip. And it was that, it was that experience that really sort of um, made me aware of just how bad things could be. So I got back to, to base that, uh, that, that Tuesday morning and I went straight to our IT department and I said, look, this is going to get bad. I think we're going to have a real issue. Let's order as many super high power laptops as we possibly can. Let's get them in. Let's prepare to disperse. My own IT department thought I was overreacting. This is nuts. And it, it actually proved prophetic because the very next week, we got the shelter in place order in the state of California. And just though that week of preparation put us in a good position for everyone to start working from home. Now, of course, uh, that suited some areas of the company better than others. The software teams were delighted. They never wanted to come into the office in the first place. If there's any me who was insisting they came into work like everyone else, they could carry on gamefully remotely. But of course, we just built our first 40 
beta prototypes at that stage, and we had a ground fleet. And some, particularly our, our technicians, literally had nothing to do. So we didn't, we didn't furlough any employee, we didn't lay anyone off, we kept the whole team in place. We actually kept recruiting and we planned for success. And I think that that's something I've really learned to plan for success. We did take a time hit for SOP, start of production, because of, so, uh, I mean, this is a truly a symbiosis. We're dependent upon so many of our suppliers. And some suppliers actually lost contracts with other car companies and were able to divert more um, resource onto our little project. So actually we saw a resurgence from some suppliers. What a, what a great paradox that was from those teams that were also working from home. But inevitably, you know, this is about the weakest link of the chain and we're dependent on so many links in that chain to put Lucid Air into production. Uh, so we have had to delay start of production into 21 due to the pandemic. Uh, but we've really minimized that and, uh, you know, not overlooking the tragedy uh, that the, the country has faced through this, these difficult times. Um, I think it's really important that, that we, we keep soldiering on for the sake of everyone, because I think that there are, there are dire warning signs out there. The, the fires in California now are a solitary reminder of the impact of global warming. And the world cannot wait for us engineers and scientists and, 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 and technologists to create a more viable path for humankind to move to sustainable mobility. And I really believe the technology that we're developing here in lucid air suits not just the air, which is a relatively high-end product, but it's mass producible, it's super high technology, and it'll find its way to, to power the more affordable cars, the next generation of affordable cars that everyone can afford. And that's what's really going to change the world. And, I, and, the, and the, the final point I'd, I'd make with the pandemic is that I think that we've seen less aircraft in the skies, we've seen clearer skies, we've seen cleaner, cleaner water, Ma mankind's footprint, largely through travel, has uh, lightened, and we've seen just how resilient some of the environment is and how it can return to a better state. Yeah, very well said. And first of all, bravo for keeping the entire team intact. I know it's been, it's hit different people and different companies differently. But um, I love to hear from a CEO who's who's kept his team together. And that's really, um, really commendable. I know it's probably been a challenge. So uh, congratulations on that. And hopefully, uh, things do improve. I have two cars, I have an electric car and a gas car. And I have pumped gas one time in the gas car since all this happened. And I remember thinking like being at a gas station around like close to proximity to people touching things that hundreds of people are touching every day. It really hit me that um, the impact of not burning fossil fuels, like people, we, we know about that, but just the logistics day to day of electric car, come home, pull into your garage, plug in a cable, go to sleep. Um, the grid is already established. I keep thinking to myself, the, the entire gasoline industry is such a house of cards. All these things have to happen right. They have to continue to find new sources of it, refining it, transporting it on big ships and pipelines that leak and spill. Um, and all these things have to be in place. Compare that to the electric vehicle. And even if in the future something were to happen or we had you know, uh, disruptions to our normal lives, the EV is for anybody who owns one already knows, incredible, just charge it at home. And if you have solar and uh, a grid, a battery pack, you could be almost independent. And that, that sense of thinking, I think, is new to me. I never thought about those sorts of things a year ago. So absolutely, EV is the answer on, on all accounts for that reason. Couldn't agree more, Ricky. And I mean, I think there's so much emphasis placed upon fast charging stations, which is uh, an undue sort of psychological um, worry, 95% of charging is done at home overnight. Especially when you have 500 miles of range. Absolutely. But you know what's really cool about the 500 mile range is, I mean, it's kind of a statement. It's, it's, a, it's a range attenuating statement. But the real value, and this is so misunderstood, the real value 
of achieving 500 miles through efficiency, not through just a humongous battery pack. Because anyone can just stuff a whole bunch of batteries in there and achieve 500 miles. That's not very smart. The real value is that we'll be able to offer versions of Lucid Air in the future which have just 300 miles with a commensurately smaller battery pack because of the efficiency. And then we can, sh we can pass that uh, cost saving onto our customers. And that efficiency, the efficiency technology that we have pioneered and we are now leading the industry with, with over four and a half miles per kilowatt hour uh, with Lucid Air on an EPA cycle, will is a key enabler to the mass market appeal of more affordable electric cars in the very near future. And that's what really excites me. It's not achieving the 500 miles range with the same size pack. It's achieving 300 miles range with a 17% smaller pack than anyone else. That's what's exciting. I think the 17% the you mentioned might get overlooked by some, but being an engineer, I that was a part that I wanted to, to touch on next, actually. So looking at the car, I got to imagine the drag coefficient is tiny. The thing just looks like it was designed in a wind tunnel to be absolutely efficient. And for EVs, we know that's really important. Then you've got all the your tech stack with inverters and batteries and all the efficiencies you can probably gain there. Then there's there's subsystems, right? You have your LED headlight design, so clearly you've you've you're bringing down the energy consumption as much as you can, How, and you don't have to get into the exact specifics. But to achieve seventeen percent is really novel, and I'm just kind of curious of all those different kinds of buckets. Where are you getting kind of like? Is it like mostly in the aero? Is it in is it the inverter efficiencies and the battery? Or how did you do it? <laughs> That's, that, that is a remarkable, yeah. yeah. So, so a lot of people think it's the Aero 0.21 CD. We've also got a, a lower A value because of the space concept, the car is smaller. So our CDA is even smaller. But you know, the average speed of a, a, an EPA five cycle test is about 28 and a half miles an hour. So actually the, the, the CDA helps us in real world. We're getting a like, we did a run with uh, Motor Trend and we achieved 490 miles range real world. The CDA helps us a lot with the 490 in real world, much more than the 517 from the, um, the, uh, the EPA. Our drive unit is about 15% more uh, efficient than anyone else's that we've measured, that we're aware of. And, and a lot of people think it's, Oh, it's a battery efficiency, battery efficiency. It's all about a battery. And there's this myopia. Oh, it's all about the battery, isn't it, Peter? And it's, I almost say, well, it's almost about everything else. Um, uh, there's a nice analogy. You could say, oh, well, how do you get 60 miles to the gallon with your lean burn gasoline engine? No one says, oh, it's all about the gas tank. They say it's because it's a lean burn, high compression, three cylinder, super high tech, uh, direct injection petrol engine. Uh, they don't say it's all about the gas tank. So it's not all about the battery when we look at an electric car. It's partly about the battery as well. We've got great battery technology, but it's about the 900 volt architecture. It's about the switching, the mathematical coding in the software that controls the switching frequency in that inverter. It's about the silicon carbide MOSFETs. It's about how we cool those silicon carbide MOSFETs. It's about how we connect that in with short bus bar connection with ultra low resistance into our three phase um, permanent magnet motor. It's about how we cool that motor. Everybody else, everybody else cools their motor primarily the stator around the periphery. Some have water jackets, that's really bad. Some better, something like Chevy Bolt, actually has transmission fluid around the stator between the casing and the stator. Tesla's a bit better, it's actually got channels in the station Model 3 uh, with hydraulic ATF fluid in there, but it's still at the periphery of the stator. We've patented an absolute scientific breakthrough that we can get the heat out super close to where it's generated, which is the copper. And, you know, it, it's, it's an annoying feature, not just copper, but most metals that conduct electricity. 
have this feature that the warmer they get, the more resistance they have. The number of ohms goes up with temperature. It's an annoying characteristic and it's a nightmare for an electric motor because you don't want that to happen. Because as soon as you conduct some electricity, the things start warming up. And as soon as they warm up, they get more resistance. So they get even hotter and hotter and hotter. So it's really important to get that heat out at the source or as close as you can. It details like that. Even our gear teeth have got a unique mathematical uh, formula uh, profile, which we've patented which makes them strong and yet very efficient. So it's, and, and we've got a, a, a smart oil pump, computer controlled oil pump. Because if you flood the motor and gearbox with a lot of oil all the time, it creates a lot of churning losses, which creates heat. And then if you've got a more efficient system, guess what happens? There's less heat. So you don't need such big radiators. So the nose can be pointier and, oh, there's less drag. So actually, you need less power, so the motors even work. So you create this beneficial circle. Yeah, physics is a cruel mistress, I've, I've always said. And, um, and hearing you talk about some of the technical challenges of, of building an EV is why I've always said I, I love seeing more engineers and like more technical people uh, in charge of companies. It's something that I think really lends to, like you, you lose sleep at night thinking about challenges and things that most people don't even know are, are challenges. So that's got to be you know, why you guys have been able to achieve this level of efficiency. Lucid is literally an engineering led company, but I have to say we're transitioning to execution mode now and we will become more of a manufacturing company. But that, that sort of that core heart of us, that core DNA, which is striving for technical excellence will remain. So that's a good segue to the next question, which would be, the factory, you guys are building a factory. I've seen some pictures of it and stuff. What kind of progress have we made? So we, we held a groundbreaking ceremony on December the 2nd uh, last year, 2019. And we were graced with Governor Ducey's presence, Governor Pavlovich from uh, uh, Sonora County, Mexico. And everyone thought we were nuts because we said, well, you know, you're not real. You haven't got a factory. How can you do this? And I've always said, look, a factory is just a, a damn big, pretty expensive tin shed with a concrete base. And, and actually, there is no mystique about building a factory. It's what you put in that factory is critical. So nine months on from that December date, we started building cars in our factory in Arizona. And this was unheard of just in, in nine short months. We're still putting finishing touches to the factory, still not quite complete but it's very near to completion. We are actually building prototype cars there. We were building them there last week. Um, That's amazing. I, 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 we, we've got 500 acres of land in Casa Grande between uh, Tucson and uh, Phoenix. That's where the factory is. We're building that out in four stages. Stage one is, 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 is nearing its completion now. Stage one is good for 34,000 units a year, which will serve us well for Lucid Air over the next two years. Then we want to get to phase two in the factory, bring stamping in-house, build in a general assembly hall, and get the uh, project gravity into the plant there, and get up to about 80, 85,000 units a year with phase two. And then we'll get platform two in and do phase three, and then ultimately phase four. We can get to about 365,000 units a year uh, with its full form of phase four on, 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 on that footprint of land. And, you know, that can't come soon enough. You know, I want us to be making a million cars a year. We've got to, we've got to have laser focus. Woods are cheap. And until we've got that car, the first car production, we haven't actually sold a single car to a single customer yet. So I have to temper my enthusiasm, uh, you know, that we need to approach the next six months with humility because there's, there's a mountain to climb. I can appreciate the focus. I know how hard it is to build a car. The fact that you guys, are, you guys aren't touting like an entire lineup and eight different things and all the renders of all that you're focusing on one thing is another one of those engineering attributes of knowing. Look, in, since the, a car has been a high tech item, there's only been one example worldwide of a new company starting and being successful in mass producing that car. And that was Tesla with Model S. It's the only time it's ever been done. I mean, the Koreans came in the 80s, government back thing. 
Before that, you'd have to look back to Porsche in the 1950s as a, a, a currently successful automaker starting up. But if you look at the cars that Porsche were making in the 50s, and not being disparaging to them, they were pretty rudimentary things. They were not, they didn't have proper crumple zones, um, airbags, they weren't, uh, they weren't computer controlled. So this has only happened once. I was fortunate, I was chief engineer on the Model S program. So, you know, um, I'm just so aware, more aware than, than most people, of just how much commitment is required to make something like that a success. And so that's only been done once before with a brilliant team of people where all the stars aligned. So how could I countenance doing anything more than one product at a time? Uh, I think one of the differentiating advantages that Lucid has is that so many of my team from Model S came and joined me here. We truly are a brand, band of brothers. We're completely aware of the enormity of this task. And, you know, just to get Lucid Air into production is, is quite daunting, actually. Do you have any rough timelines on when you guys would be holding an IPO? As you can imagine, there's there's interest. There's people who who hear you talking about your your IP and your tech and, and seeing this car that that are wondering this question. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be an exact date or anything. But is there like a like a time frame? So I I, I publicly stated that I'm I, I, you know within the next 24 months I think an IPO is highly likely. Um, it is part of our strategy to go public. Um, and I think that what really, I can see the, 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 the interest and, and, and the, 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 the number of people that what would want to invest in us because, you know, there's a whole bunch of, of startup companies there and what different, uh, out, out in California across the US at the moment. But what differentiates Lucid is the core technology. I really believe that, uh, and, 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 and some probably would challenge this because, the, but I've got the data. And I'm a, I'm a real engineer, I've got, I've got all the data, and I, I know that we've got more advanced technology in drivetrain, in the core battery, motor, transmission, power electronics, and the software that powers that and efficiency uh, than, 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 than any other system that I benchmark from it, any other manufacturer. The closest is about, at car level, is about 50, uh, 17% difference um, and I, I think that makes us a compelling future investment so watch this space one question i had for you is do you currently i see the lucid air as to your point maybe like an s-class competitor somebody who's looking for a, an estate saloon type of a car um, is your plan as a company to remain more premium more flagship or do you have plans to to come down and have a, a second generation model closer into the 30s and 40s and 50s sort of a thing? Yeah, I think some people have been surprised that we've pitched uh, the Dream Edition at $169,000. Um, you know, uh, this is not necessarily a Tesla competitor. It, it, it's, not, it's not aimed at that. We're aiming at S-Class Mercedes and we're aiming at AMG versions of that with our first product. You know, that our, our, our Dream Edition has over a thousand horsepower. It does a standing quarter in 9.9 .9 seconds. That, you know, if I were to pay three times that, I still can't buy a car with that performance. The nearest is like a million. The nearest competitor of performance is a million dollars. And we've got a, over 500 mile range. You know, a, 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 an AMG S class cannot hold a candle to the, the specs of a dream edition. I actually think it's a bargain at 169,000. It's because some people, some observers are comparing that directly with a Tesla Model S, and it's a class above a Model S, that that disparity in price seems unrealistic, and it's not. My passion is to make this technology available en masse and truly mass produce and change the world. And I recognize there's a limited number of people who can afford a car over $100,000. So that's where Lucid Air comes in, which is my passion to get the car under $80,000. And we've announced in 2022, we'll bring the price of Lucid Air down under $80,000. And before that, late next year, Lucid Air touring, $95,000. Um, so I'm committed to make these cars 
much more affordable. It's just that the Dream Edition is just such a machine. It's got some very special technology and it's got a unique blend of performance and range. It's kind of my personal choice of the car. Uh, and, and, and that's what makes it so compelling. And anybody who has looked at a Porsche Taycan knows that 169000 is not a lot of money in terms of what you're getting in terms of performance. So yeah, I think it is a question of of reference, I think. And I've seen a lot of articles where people are saying it's from 169. It's not. It's all in at 169. So I've, I've, I've seen some, some YouTube videos where people are saying, well, it's from 169, so I'll end up spending 188. No, it is not. Hear it from me. It's an all in deal, 169. You get the full house. It's not a dime more than that and you get the seven and a half thousand discount so it's it's what is that it's 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 161 500 with the seven and a half thousand um credit platform two will be more more, more affordable again we're going to go with uh pr progressively more affordable cars now we've got to walk before we can run there's a reason why we're starting at high end and moving down market because the first product defines the brand but moreover uh, it costs an order of magnitude more to industrialize, say, a Volkswagen Golf compared with, say, a Rolls-Royce. The Rolls-Royce is made largely hand-built in a sm relatively small factory in small numbers. The Golf is all about numbers. It costs a fortune to build a highly automated, huge factory to churn out Golfs by the zillions. So this is misunderstood. I'm often asked, why don't I make a start with a small, with a small car which is more affordable? we wouldn't exist because I would have to go and ask investors, please invest $10 billion in Lucid, a company that no one's heard of. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't get that money. But for an order of magnitude less, we can make a start. We can really create world-class technology. And then the next step will be our platform too, which will be more affordable. Now, I don't wanna wait till we get to platform three in maybe 26 and then start producing a car at $25,000 because time is not on our side. Global warming is accelerating and we need to get mankind to mass sustainable mobility. And that's why I'd like to make some of the landmark technologies that we have developed at Lucid, which are truly mass producible, available to other more automakers to help them with their transition. Some of them are struggling with that transition. And you may think, well, this is too good to be true, but we've shown that we've got incredible efficiency. We've shown that with just 113 kilowatt hour battery pack, we can get over 517 mile range. We've shown on the drag strip, we've got incredible performance. Nobody, and that's the same car with over 500 mile range that we can get the 9.9, .9, that's Dream Edition, 9.9 .9 seconds to standing quarter. Um, this, is, this is now proven. Everyone can see just how miniaturized that technology is, how well that would suit a smaller car. What I can't prove yet is just how designed for mass production our technology is, because to do that, to prove that, I'd have to sh unveil it to the world, the innards of that technology. And I can't do that yet because I, I don't want people copying it. I can't show that until the last moment. Uh, but please take it from me, We've achieved incredible efficiency. We've achieved great miniaturization. And we've got true design for mass production in a way that no other EV powertrain has been designed for mass production. And do you know that's perhaps what excites me the most because then that can be a platform for a car which is maybe $25,000 car. Maybe it's another automaker that makes that car with Lucid's underlying technology. That's fantastic. I think a lot of people do not understand how difficult it is to make 100,000 of something. I, I, I think that the nuance of manufacturing engineering, I think is lost on some people. That's really positive to hear. And I think the strategy is right. So that gets to the, the conclusion here. If, if you have future events or a chance for us to see the car, I'm hoping uh, you could send an invitation our way. I'd love to, to see it or factory tours or whatever else you have in the future, um, I would just be thrilled and honored to, to, to be a part of it because I love this company. I love what you guys are doing and um, I wanna see you guys go far. Thanks so much, Ricky. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you and please stay in touch. And uh, I love what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Enjoy the rest of your week and thank you for making time. I appreciate it. 
My pleasure.